Good to see everybody today. You got glad to be in church today? It's been a good day. Thanks to our teams, uh, the team up here, teams in the back all across, uh, almost said across, all across the land, all across the church today. Uh, our volunteer teams, uh, we're so appreciative and, and grateful for the coffee and the donuts and watching our uh, toddlers and babies and kids today. And uh, such a good thing when the people of God gather together and love one another and serve one another. Uh, that's where the life is. Amen. That's where the life is, and loving and serving. And uh, I'm glad you're here today and a part of what God's doing at, at FCF here in the great state of Pell City. Uh, again, if you are a guest here uh, today for the first time, or maybe you're back for the first time in a bit, we just want to say welcome home and welcome back. Uh, my name's Pat. I'm the campus pastor here, and a uh, joy to have you with us. Everybody else that calls this place home on a regular basis, uh, I mean this. It's such a joy and an encouragement to me to see your face today uh, and for us to be able to gather uh, together. We're going to have a good day. We're going to be continuing, uh, can you believe it, week number seven of our Book of James series, and uh, looks like this series is probably going to take us through May-ish, uh, maybe even a little bit of June, uh, so we got a little ways to go, but uh, uh, good news today, we're going to finish chapter two of the book of James, and so we've been in it for seven weeks, and I just want to encourage you, as I have every single week, don't just wait to get to Sunday to hear the book or the letter of James. Take some time during the week, read it on your own, and uh, I issued, uh, I want to remind you, for some of you that have been here for most of the series, this is going to sound like a broken record to you, but I just want to remind you, uh, I issued at the very beginning of this series... Uh, probably the most brilliantly titled thing I've ever come up with. It's the FCF Pell City Campus Book of James Reading Challenge. Boom. <laughs> Roasted. It's the best. So, uh, and basically all that is, uh, it's just this. I'm encouraging you, uh, read one chapter of the Book of James a day. It'll take you five to seven minutes. And in five days, you will have made your way through the Book of James. And then when you get finished with it, just start the process over again. Now, I know that um, after a while, uh, this has been seven weeks, we've had 35 days, uh, so to speak, to, uh, to cut, no, 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 49 days. That's my math was off. You should have corrected me there. 49 days. I was not a good mathematician. Uh, 49 days to read through this. And I know it, it can seem and get a little monotonous. I know you would never say that out loud, so I'll say it for you, uh, reading the same thing over and over again. And so here's what I want to challenge you to do as we're still in the series of James. Um, just spice it up a little bit. Right? Bring some change to it. Some people do this. If you're reading it, uh, here's what you can do. Let your smart app, uh, Bible app, read it to you. As you're driving in the car, listen to it instead of reading it. It might kind of hit a different uh, sense, so to speak. And so listen to it. And then I want to give you also uh, a couple of really, really good resources that you might not have yet. Uh, one of them you probably don't, but the other one some of you might. I hope a lot of you do. A couple of resources that can help you dig in a little deeper. And so if, if you don't want to maybe get through an entire chapter, but you'd like to kind of uh, kind of like just camp in, in a couple of verses and kind of dig deeper and find out what they really mean, uh, there's this website called Blue Letter Bible. Anybody ever heard of this before? A few scholars out there, right? Uh, blueletterbible.org. And uh, you can see up there it is... A wonderful, wonderful wealth of resource. Uh, blueletterbible.org is the site, and there are commentaries on there. And if you don't know what a commentary uh, is, I'll just explain it very simply. It's basically really smart, learned, educated people that have studied this kind of stuff for their life, and they write commentary off of each verse, and it explains some hard-to-understand things where we can kind of understand them uh, in a little simpler way. And there's all kinds of commentaries. There are dictionaries embedded in this site. There are Greek dictionaries, Hebrew dictionaries, all different sorts of translations. If you want to get nerdy, blueletterbible.org is the place for you. So, so check it out if you want to dig a little deeper. I encourage you to do it. And then something we offer to our church people for absolutely free. If you come to our church, you can get this next resource for free. It's called Right Now Media. How many of you have Right Now Media in some way, shape, form, or fashion? Yeah, quite a few of you do. It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful resource for you and for your family. It's got something for, for toddlers and kids and teens and tweens and adults and older adults. It's got stuff for everybody, and you can sign up for it absolutely free. Uh, you can go up there to our fcafamily.com. You can click on media, and everybody see where it says right now media? 
you just click right there. And then it's going to take you to the next page where you can create an account. And it's absolutely free. And they have some incredible, incredible teaching on the book of James. Far better teachers than me with greater insights that's going to give you maybe a different medium than just reading it yourself. Francis Chan has a wonderful five-week series on the book of James. I encourage you to watch it. Uh, Just a different way. If it's getting a little monotonous, this is just a way where you can dive in in a different way or maybe even uh, a little deeper. Everybody good with that? That good, helpful stuff? Just pretend and help make me feel better. Yeah, it's good, helpful stuff. So take advantage of it. Dive deep into the Word of God, and uh, it's going to help us and transform us. And we need to be engaged with the Word of God. Listen, if we're only getting it on a Sunday, we are missing the life that Jesus has come to give us. Right? There is power when we give the Word of God place in our lives. Psalm 119.11, this is a scripture I've talked about often up here, especially during this series. It says this, I have hidden your word in my heart. I've hidden scripture in my heart that I might not sin against you. I don't know if you know this, but actually being engaged with the Word of God can be so powerful and transformational. It can change the very habits that we have. It can keep us from sin. And here's what I know. If sin separates us from God and brings destruction into our lives, and then the things that we touch, it can fracture those things. If sin brings that kind of destruction, then it makes sense to me. We should take some measures to limit the sin in our lives, yes? We should take some measures, and this is one step everybody can take. Every single one of us can take the time to meditate on, to read, and to get Scripture into our life so that it becomes a normal pattern of thinking for us. And if it becomes a normal pattern of thinking, then it changes our behavior, all right? And so it's critical that we get engaged uh, with the Word of, of God. It's so, so important and transformational. And so uh, with that, let's get ready to dive into the Word of God this morning. We're going to finish James chapter 2, as I said a moment ago. We're going to cover verses 14 through 26. And so if you have your Bible, uh, some of you have a physical Bible, I encourage you to pick it up, open it up to James chapter 2, open your smart app. You can follow along on the screen as, as well. And uh, it's going to kind of harken back to our text today. It's going to harken back to something we, we kind of covered three weeks ago, I believe, uh, in, in James, James chapter 1 in verse 22 that said this. It said, but don't just listen to God's word, do what it says. Don't be a hearer only, be a doer of the word, because if you don't, you will deceive yourselves. You're fooling yourselves. Hearing is important. It's an important first step. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, but that cannot be the last step. That is the beginning. We must hear and then do. And so today is going to kind of dive a little deeper into that idea that we've covered in James chapter 1 already. And I want to give you this thought before we read and before we dive in. Did I just get darker up here? There we go. Okay. (laughs) Fooling with me there. I don't know if the Lord didn't want me to say something there or not. Just dim it down, bring it up. Um, I want to give you this thought today uh, before we move on and read the text for today. And I want you to keep this in mind because this is an important point uh, that I think James is is making, all right? And and here it is. You can take some notes. It's on our FCF family app. Uh, It's this. If our belief does not change our behavior, then our belief really isn't something we truly believe. And it's hard to hear, it's hard to stomach, but this is the reality that so often we are afraid to talk about or consider, and it's really critical that we consider it. You're going to understand this as we walk through the text uh, today. If our belief does not change our behavior, then our belief really isn't something that we truly believe. Now, this is just isn't something I'm saying. You can get mad at James, all right? James is the one that's, that's putting this idea out. We can say we believe all day long, but if our lives are not changed by what we believe, then all we have is just talk. It's just words because there has to be something more than words or, or thoughts. James would say a faith that is real and alive is one that produces good works or good deeds. So keep that in mind. Everybody ready to go today? Not home. Dive into scripture. You ready? All right, here we go. James 2, 14. We're going to read through verse 17 first, and then we'll get through the rest as we move forward. So here's how it reads. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, 
Who's he talking to? Everybody, all right? What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food and clothing and you say, this is comical to me, goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Yay. It's hard. Faith by itself isn't enough. Now, when I read and when I say that faith by itself isn't enough, good church people, like there should be red flags going off in your mind right now. There should be some warning sirens going off, right? When I say faith by itself isn't enough, that sounds weird, doesn't it? It doesn't feel right to me either because everywhere else in Scripture, specifically the New Testament and pointing to Paul, Paul tells us faith alone is enough, right? James says faith alone isn't enough. Paul says faith alone is enough. I mean, Paul tells us over we are saved by grace through what? Through faith, right? It's nothing we have done, faith alone. Ephesians 2, chapter 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by what? Works, so that no one can boast. These seem to be in contradiction to one another, doesn't it? It appears to be. One says faith alone isn't enough. The other says faith alone is enough. And so it's very important before we start into this that we work this out and get a proper understanding about this idea of faith because so many in James's and Paul's day just had a misunderstanding about faith and so many in our day have a misunderstanding as, as well. And so James says faith alone isn't enough. Paul says it is enough. Who do we believe? Pat, which one is right? My answer is yes. Both are actually right, and I'll explain why. I'll give you a very simple uh, statement here. Paul's teaching often focuses on the time before conversion, whereas James's teaching is focusing primarily on the time after conversion. All right, everybody got that? That's critical that we get that in our minds as we understand rightly what it is to be saved and have salvation through Christ alone. It is his work, not our work, that saves us. That is good news for us, all right? God does that because God is good. Paul focuses on the time before conversion, where James focuses on the time after conversion. Paul says our works don't bring us to Christ, but James would say now that we are in Christ, Good works should be the result of a faith we have so graciously been given, right? This is what James is saying. Good works don't save you, but after you are saved, good works should be the proof that points to the fact that you are saved. We don't do good things to be right with God. We do good things because we are right with God. And see, this is what Paul and James are saying. They're actually along the same lines. Everybody got a good understanding of that? It's critical that we have that, uh, that understanding. James is teaching people who are already in the church. James is teaching people who, who have already said, yes, I believe in Christ. I have confessed him as Lord, and I have believed. And we cannot get that mixed up. We are saved by grace through faith alone. It is not our doing. But Paul actually says this, and it comes right into line with James in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where he says, My dear brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, when you get a glimpse of God's mercy and you've been given God's mercy, now you offer yourself as a living sacrifice to him. Now you do the good works because you've seen the great mercy that he has for you. And everything kind of comes in to line. In other words, because we have received a great mercy... Of course we would do good works because of the mercy we have received. There ought to be proof that we have been transformed and changed. Yes, we ought to be different after we meet Christ. 
We ought to be growing and moving forward. And this is the point where James comes in and tries to push those people who are already in the church, so to speak, to consider and take inventory of your life and see, is your faith really alive or is your faith dead? And this is what James is talking about. And he begins with a rhetorical question. Does everyone know what a rhetorical question is? Okay, that was a rhetorical question too. It's kind of a question we all assume and answer quietly in our minds. James says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? What good is it? Can that kind of faith save anyone? So, what good is it to say you have faith and do nothing with it? It's no good. Can that kind of faith save anyone? James would say, no. And listen, James is not trying to get you to be fearful. He's not trying to get you to doubt, am I going to heaven, am I this or that? James just wants us to be honest. And if the answer is no, I'm not producing good works with my faith, then today is a good day to make a change and do something about it. This is where James is moving us to. Because in reality, the essence of everything that Jesus has done is always expressed through loving action and not just words. Everything that Jesus does, it's words, but then it's also expressed through loving action. In Galatians, Paul would tell us this. He says, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. It is not enough to just say the right things. We must begin to do the good work that Jesus has done and shown us. And so today, it's a take an inventory type of day in your life. Today, I don't expect a lot of amens. Today, I don't expect a lot of big smiles. Because this is really kind of a James is just pointing right at us and really getting into our lives. And he's kind of, he's messing a little bit with us. And he wants us to consider where we are. And so today, I want you to honestly take an inventory of your faith. And here's what I want you to know. I also must take a big inventory of my faith because I don't know if you know this or not, but in the very next chapter in the first verse, for people like me and for other teachers in the church, all my small group leaders and teachers in the church, listen to what James says in chapter 3, verse 1. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. So I just want to say this. We all up in this together, right? All of us need to take account of where we are in our faith because it actually really matters. And so with that, let's dive into uh, a little deeper what James is talking about with faith. And he actually describes three types of faith in these 13 verses. And uh, the first type of faith that James describes is this one. He first describes a dead faith, a dead faith. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Again, suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say goodbye and have a good day and stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing, what good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is what? It's dead and useless. And you have to remember James, like he's the... He's the pastor of the OG church, like the original church in Jerusalem. He's also an overseer for many other churches as they, people, people have been scattered into all these different areas because of persecution. And so James holds a pretty big position within the church. And what was happening in his church and other churches around the area, there was this prevailing problem that was kind of permeating through the church. And the idea was this, that as long as I think the right thing about God, as long as I think the right thing, then I'm good. As long as I think the right thing, I'm in, and I don't have to do anything else other than think and believe the right thing. That was a problem in James's day. Church, I think that's a problem in our day. If we just think the right thing, then we're fine and we're good. Well, you know what? I said my sinner's prayer when I was four, and I walked down the aisle of the church, bless God, and I shook the pastor's hand. I got my name on the roll, and I am good to go. I'm going to get into heaven when I die. 
And I just have to say, if your idea of the goal of Christianity is just to make it to heaven when you die, you have greatly misunderstood what Christianity is all about. The goal of Christianity is not to get us up there, but rather to get up there down here through us. We are to make it on earth as it is in heaven. This is the great goal of Christianity. This is what Jesus gave himself for and then handed the mission over to us that we would make it on earth as it is in heaven. We do not need to misunderstand the goal of Christianity. It is to make it on earth as it is in heaven. And the only way that happens is if our faith produces good deeds and good works. We cannot just say we have faith. We can't just think the right things and then do nothing with it. James would say that kind of faith is dead. James would say if you think the right things about Jesus and there's no change in your life, Jesus probably isn't where you think he really is. And so we need to make some changes. And we need to repent. We need to reorient our life in such a way that we change and we are different. I want to read this again so we get a good understanding. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Again, suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say, goodbye and have a good day. I don't know that why that makes me smile, but it does. It's funny. And eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does it do? So you see faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. This is very important. Five times in 13 verses, James alludes to or blatantly talks about the idea of faith without works is dead. You guys, five times in 13 verses. That is a lot of whatever percentage it is. You already know I'm terrible at math, so I'm not going to even try. Five times in 13 verses, James alludes to this idea. It is a repeated thing. James is saying a passive faith is not a saving faith. In verse 14, what good is it if you say you have faith but don't do anything? Again, verse 14, can that kind of faith save you? Verse 17, faith by itself, if it does not have works, it's dead. Verse 20, faith apart from works is useless. Verse 26, so faith apart from works is dead. Do you think James is trying to get us to understand something here? Five times in 13 verses. And let me give you a little heads up when you study Scripture. Repeated things are important things. Repeated things are important things. And James wants us to consider, is our faith alive, is it active, or is it, is it dead? And notice what he says in verse 14. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you what? If you say. If you say you have faith. James doesn't say that person actually has faith, a real faith. He just says they say they have faith. We claim it with our words, but our life speaks otherwise. Listen, people with dead faith often replace works with words, right? We excuse away why we're not doing this or why we're not doing that. We talk a big game, but we never really do anything. And James would say, this is the result of a dead faith. Listen to what John says, 1 John chapter 2. We know that we have come to know him, Jesus, if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is what? Yeah, not many amens today. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is made truly complete in them. This is how we know that we are in him. So again, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? No. And then he gives a great real-life example of the problem that was happening, I believe, in the early church. And this problem definitely happens in our church. Not our church, but other churches in town. Not ours, but... James says this, suppose you see your brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm and eat well, and then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What, what good does that do? Listen, 
words of compassion without acts of compassion is not a live faith in Christ. It's not alive at all. Listen, if you pull over to the side of the road and you see a person with a flat tire changing a tire and you walk up to said person, you say, hello, I see you have a flat tire. I hope this goes well for you. I hope it inflates. Good day. And you get back in your car and you leave. When you had the power or the capacity to help but you chose not to, What good does that do? That is not a faith that is alive and active. We cannot just have words of compassion. We must be moved by compassion. We must be compelled to do something about what we see. It's a family value of ours here at FCF that we are a people that are moved by compassion. When when Scripture says Jesus was moved by compassion, he was compelled by what he saw, like the Greek there is just, it's really wonderful. When it says Jesus was moved by compassion, it actually means he was moved deep in his bowels. Not vowels, his bowels. Like something was churning and I got to take action about what's happening. That's the picture I get in my head and I'm sorry. We've all eaten Taco Bell too late. We've, we've all had crystals, crystals. We've all had crystals every now and then at the wrong time and things begin to move deep in our bowels, right? And you got to take action based on what's churning inside of you, yes? Because if you don't, You're in trouble. You're in trouble. Thank you, Mr. Gene. Thank you. You are in trouble. That saved me from being inappropriate. Thank you, brother. (laughs) Blessings to you. Jesus was moved by compassion. We just can't see something and say something and not do something. Here's what I know. Every one of us can do something, right? You don't have to do everything Just do something about what you see. When Jesus looked at a crowd, he was moved by compassion to the point that he gave himself for what he saw, for people. And if we are to be followers of Christ and take up our cross and come after him, this is what it looks like for us to be true Christ followers, moved by compassion. And so James would say, and I think we can get a really good understanding of what James is saying. So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Can we agree with that now today that we understand this? Unless it produces good deeds, it's dead and useless. There should be fruit attached to our faith. And so I just want to ask you to ask yourself a question. Is my faith alive or is my faith dead? You just be honest where you are today. He goes on to describe another faith, another type of faith in verse 18. And I don't mean for this to sound like it's going to sound. And I'm not calling you what I'm going to describe as this type of faith. James says this, not me, okay? We good? Verse 18, now someone may argue, make up an argument. Some people have faith, others have good deeds. But James says, but I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? He says, ah, I will show you my faith by my good deeds. Listen to verse 19. You say you have faith, for you believe there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this and tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Second type of faith James describes. I'll term it this way and then I'll soften it. Second type of faith James describes is a demonic faith. I'm not calling you a demon, okay? Not what I'm saying. Another way to describe, this is a very deceptive faith type of faith. And this is where a lot of people kind of reside, a very deceptive type of faith. The first way we do this, we deceive ourselves, is James makes up an argument, right? Some may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds, right? What do we always try to do? We try to argue away our responsibility to do something that costs us. Always. We deceive ourselves to actually think we're in the right when we argue away our responsibility to do good works, right? Some people would actually say, well, brother, I just have the gift of faith. I have the gift of prayer. Listen, you go feed the homeless, I'm gonna pray that the homeless get fed. I'm gonna go in my prayer closet and pray for the poor to be, their needs be met. 
That's my gift. How foolish. If we see a need, you don't pray about meeting needs. You meet needs. The whole of the gospel is about meeting people where they are, period. You may never hear me say this again, but here it goes. I'll say it one time. Pray less, do more. That feels weird. Let me say it this way. Stop praying about whether you should meet the needs of people or not. Meet needs. You don't have to pray about the teaching and the commands that Jesus has given. The answer is always yes. Always. You have to pray about it. It's always yes. Don't be deceived. Don't argue your way out of the commands of Jesus. This is a very deceptive type of faith. Verse 19, you say you have faith, for you believe there is one God. Good for you. And the reason he points to this, you say there is one God, the Hebrew people had this thing called the Shema. Everybody say Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. It was the Shema, and that's how it started. They said this every day of their lives. And it would be very easy to think, I've said my Shema, I've confessed my belief about God, I'm good without doing anything. And this is why James uses that one God here, and he says, good for you. You say there's one God? Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How, how foolish can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? You know, the reality of what I have discovered as I read, especially the New Testament, demons have really good theology. They do. They often recognize, believe, and acknowledge who Jesus is. In the Gospels, demons call Jesus the Holy One of God, the Messiah, the Christ, and in Mark's Gospel, demons say they know Jesus. Let me bring this into context. In church circles today, if someone says, I know Jesus and believe he's the Messiah, what do we say? You're in, and then we leave you alone forever, right? The church, we have been so focused and happy about getting people to state facts about Jesus that we have failed to call people to action. And so we must move to action. And if anything is going to change in the church today, it is going to start when the people of God actually begin to do the things that God has called us to do. Having right beliefs is a good start. But if it's not matched with action, our faith is dead and deceptive and demonic, and the fallacy of faith without works, it always leads to deception, self-righteousness, arrogance, and evil. Always. When we are puffed up with knowledge and we have no action, we begin to think we're better and our poo smells better than everybody else's. Self-righteous people and arrogant people are just the worst, aren't they? Jesus thinks so. Go read your Gospels. And watch how Jesus responds to and interacts with those who are self-righteous and arrogant. Knowledge without application leads to self-righteous and arrogance. Look to any church scandal today, and that's probably where it is. It happens all the time. And the only way to change this is to begin to do the things that he's called us to do. Our behavior must match what we say we believe. A dead faith, a a deceptive faith, demonic faith, and then the last kind of faith James describes, and this is the one he's pointing us to and closing the chapter down with, is a dynamic faith. A dynamic faith. And in verse 21, he starts with, with a big hitter in the Old Testament, right? All the Jewish Christians would definitely know who he's talking about. He says, don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. You see, his faith and his actions work together. Listen to this. His actions made his faith complete, whole. And so it happened just as the scripture said. Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called a friend of God. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do and not by faith alone. Remember what we talked about at the beginning, don't get this confused. And then he uses another example. 
You remember Rahab. You remember Rahab, right? Rahab, the prostitute, is another example. If you don't remember Rahab, when I just said prostitute, you did this. Okay? Rahab, the prostitute, is another example. She was shown, listen, to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them away safely by a different road. I wish we had time to go into these stories in depth. We just don't. Uh, But he closes up by saying, just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. James here uses, I don't think you could use two different ends of the spectrum to describe his one point that what we do with our faith says a lot about how real our faith really is. This is his big point. And he uses two people. He uses Abraham, like a key figure in, in, in the Old Testament, right, in the Hebrew Scriptures, key. Like when I say Abraham, like Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them. I don't know if you knew this, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, right leg, left leg. This is the Father Abraham that I'm talking about, right? Like that Abraham, the patriarch of the Jews, the Jews, his faith was made complete by what he did. And then, like, this would have just been a mic drop moment for people that were listening. Because if you understand ancient Near Eastern culture, especially if you are a Jew, uh, you don't like Gentile people who are non-Jewish people, especially if it's a woman. Like, that's one thing in ancient Near Eastern culture. They had no value. And then on top of it, it's a Gentile woman. It's a prostitute. And for James to put on the same playing field, Father Abraham and Rahab the prostitute, and say, these two people had perfect faith. That is the wildest thing that I could think to say if I were in his shoes. But he says it. And it doesn't matter who you are, what class you belong to, what your status is. Here's the only thing that matters. Faith expressing itself through love. What you do with what you say you believe matters the most. And here's the bottom line and what we see, especially from Rahab. Everything can change with one act of faith. Everything can change with one act of faith, as it did for Abraham and as it did for Rahab. One last point about Rahab. I don't know if you know this or not, but in the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew begins to run through uh, the genealogy of Jesus. And if you don't know what a genealogy is, it's just the ancestry, uh, I don't know if that was the right word, of Jesus. You know what I'm trying to say. And he begins to run through it. And you know who has a hand and responsibility in the bloodline of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah being born into this world? Rahab the prostitute. Listen, one act of faith can change everything. That means all of us today are one step away from a changed life. And it starts with believing in Jesus, but but it really is made complete when we begin to follow the teachings and the commands that Jesus has given us. This is where the rubber meets the road, and this is where faith comes alive when we begin to follow him. Good works must accompany a genuine faith. It must. 2 Corinthians 5, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new is here. And if there is no evidence of a new life, then something just needs to change. And we're one act of faith away from change. Just as the body is dead without breath, so faith is dead without good works. Now let me take the pressure off because I know it can feel like Pat, I got to get it right all of the time. Let me say it this way. A faith that is effective to us and then through us to others, a faith that is effective isn't one that's perfect, but rather it's one that's making progress. That's the way I want you to think of it. Not one that's perfect, but it's one that's making progress. I'm taking some steps. I'm growing a little bit transformation is happening. I step back, but when I step back, I'm going to get up and I'm going to step forward again. Progress is happening. This is the sign of a faith that is alive. And so as we close, I would just ask you to ask yourself the question, are there signs of progress with my faith? Being honest as you can be with yourself today, is my faith alive? 
Or honestly, is my faith dead? And if it's dead, Jesus would just extend his arms and just say, come home. Take a step towards me, towards life. And I want to invite you to take that step today. 2 Corinthians 13, Paul says it this way, examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you failed the test of genuine faith. What is genuine faith? We just had a good long lesson on what genuine faith looks like. And is there genuine faith in my life? If not, today is a good day to make a change, yes? So where you are, whatever you need to do with what you've just heard, I wanna invite you, take the step, do what you need to do, confess, repent, believe, and resolve to have a faith that is active. Let your faith be alive, amen?